This didn't make the main video, but I couldn't go a whole month without talking about space. So let's discuss plutonium-238, the most viable fuel for deep space missions. I'm mainly going to be summarizing a couple articles from NASA linked in the description, so please check them out and Google if you want to learn more. Welcome to Bad Astra. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We need to talk about polyamory. I'm secretly a black hole. Do they finally need me to captain a starship? Yeah, yeah honey, that makes perfect sense. Isn't physics fun? Further study is needed. To be suitable for deep space missions, a radioisotope or radioactive isotope must meet the following criteria. 1. Not be readily absorbed into the body in the unlikely event of a launch accident. Usually, if it doesn't dissolve in water, which is the majority of the squishy electric meat sacks we all pilot, you're good. 2. Not be toxic when ingested or injected, because things get boring in the void of space, and humans like asking the question, how much of this toxic thing can I ingest for fun without dying? 3. Have relatively low neutron, beta, and gamma radiation emissions, so we don't damage all those expensive rocket instruments. Beta and gamma radiation are why we can't have nice things, science Tommy. 4. Be stable at high temperatures and have a long 15 to 100 year half-life, so it lasts a while. Because space is big. Really big. Like, you won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts compared to space. 5. Have a high power density. More heat power in less space. Because weight is super expensive when launching a rocket. <laughs> Let's fat shame some radioactive elements, shall we? No way that could backfire on the internet. Basically, don't kill the people, don't kill the instruments, don't crap out on us, and keep it high and tight. Apparently, meeting all these conditions is difficult, because plutonium 238s the only radioisotope that does. It doesn't tend to kill people or instruments. But if the Trump presidency has taught us anything, it's that preventing deaths by meeting a seemingly simple condition is a big ask for deeply incompetent radioisotopes. The only radioisotope that has consistently met the basic criteria is plutonium-238, which has a half-life of 88 years, a high power density, and has already proven itself on over two dozen U.S. space missions in the past 50 years. The Curiosity rover on Mars and the New Horizons spacecraft flyby of Pluto were both powered by plutonium-238. This plutonium-238 is used in ceramic form, which is not NASA's new creative fundraising solution to continue doing incredible science. Your local craft fair goers could not afford these radioisotope ceramics, and honestly, they aren't as impressive as the metalwork Paul has been perfecting during COVID. If there's ever an accident and the fuel gets released onto the onboard environment, you don't want the humans breathing in fine particles of radioactive stuff. The ceramic pellet is designed to break into large pieces rather than getting vaporized, and is also insoluble, which means even if the void gets super boring and the astronauts decide to eat some plutonium to pass the time, their bodies won't absorb it. Plutonium dioxide is a radioactive material that produces alpha particles and is used as fuel in radioisotope power systems. Alpha particles are helium-4 particles, which are larger than most radiation particles and can be blocked by material as thin as paper, or even as thin as my patients with flat earthers. If the ancient Greeks figured out the Earth was round, why can't you, Tila Tequila? Radioisotope power systems turn the natural radioactive decay of plutonium-238 into heat, and then into electrical power. Think of these systems like the fungi of radioisotopes, feeding off the rotting corpse to fuel themselves in the beautiful circle of radioactive life. You may be asking yourself, wait, don't Mars rovers use solar panels? Why can't we use that for deep space missions? That's free energy, which doesn't weigh anything, right? Well, solar panels aren't exactly lightweight. For example, the Cassini mission, launched by the most powerful available rocket, would have needed a solar panel surface area of over 500 square meters. That's bigger than a basketball court, and too heavy for even the biggest rocket they had. 
Space Jam's in-orbit sequel is going to have to wait for more powerful rockets. Anyways, plutonium-238 is non-fissile, so it wouldn't work in a nuclear reactor or bomb, but it's still awesome. Every isotope has different strengths. Even if you feel overshadowed by siblings who can power or destroy the world, maybe your destiny is in helping humans seek out new worlds, exploring new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no person has gone before. Astra out. Hi, Editing Astra here. So after I finished recording this, Eris came across the article, Chernobyl Fungus Could Shield Astronauts from Cosmic Radiation, and we had to talk about it. The Earth's atmosphere and magnetic field protect us from most cosmic radiation, but while astronauts are in space, they don't have that protection. Mars doesn't have the same atmosphere or magnetic fields, so on a Mars mission, an astronaut would be exposed to 66 times the radiation of someone who stayed on Earth. This DNA-damaging cosmic radiation is actually one of the biggest threats to astronaut safety on long-term missions, and colonizing Mars could have cancerous side effects. If only there were some magic mushrooms, which could protect the astronauts by eating the dangerous radiation for breakfast. Enter Clodosporium spherospherum, an extremophile species which uses radiosynthesis, eating radiation like plants eat light, to thrive in fun tourist destinations like the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The radiotropic fungus uses melanin, that thing I as a ginger am severely lacking, to convert X-rays and gamma rays into energy. Scientists don't fully understand the process yet, but it's sort of like how chlorophyll helps plants convert light through photosynthesis. And because the fungus is self-replicating, astronauts could always grow more radiation shielding in space without needing a resupply from Earth. So slap a layer of fungus on our ship and let's go, science Tommy! Now, if this seems too good to be true, congrats. You have a critical mind. Scientists notice that radiation on Earth is mostly X-rays and gamma rays, but cosmic radiation is different and involves highly energetic particles, mostly protons, which are way more destructive. So there was no guarantee that these magic mushrooms would work, which is why they sent some to the ISS to find out. The experiment on the ISS showed that not only did the magic mushrooms survive and grow, a thin layer of it significantly reduced radiation exposure. Extrapolating the results, researchers estimated an 8-inch layer of this fungus could negate the difference between Martian and Terran radiation exposure. Obviously, further study is needed, and initial use of this fungus would be in combination with other radiation shielding technology. But this research is another example of just how cool biotechnology can be. Evolution often happens upon simple and effective solutions to engineering and design problems humanity faces. Astra out. for joining us here on Bad Astra. If you enjoyed watching, please like this video, leave a comment telling us what topic you'd like to see next month, and share it with everyone you know. Be sure to also subscribe and ring the notification bell so you never miss a new episode. And if you can't get enough of me, Eris, and Science Tommy, join our Patreon, where we post behind the scenes, deep dives, and other fun content. A special thank you to all of our Patreon supporters who make these videos possible. Astra out.